Hello and welcome to Snowy Cold Winter Stories of Scotland. I'm Annie, wishing that I knew how to play a fiddle. And I'm Jenny, trapped inside a fairy hill playing cards with the badgers and doing surprisingly badly. Yeah, these guys are wily. Badgers are card sharks, especially the enchanted ones. (laughs) I wish I'd known that before I got locked in a hundred year game with them. (laughs) Today we've got a fun little festive episode up in the far, far north of Scotland. We're hopping on the ferry to Shetland to meet the Trows. How jolly! For anyone who hasn't already met a Trow, the English translation is roughly troll or hobgoblin. The Trows are cousins to the fairies or elves that we speak of quite a lot. We also get fairy stories in Shetland and in the far north, but we don't see trows travelling much further south than Caithness, so their home is in the far north of Scotland. They enjoy the rocky coasts and island way of life far too much. I do like the idea of trows coming down and visiting the mainland to see their fairy cousins for New Year's and for Christmas, and just being really impressed by the size of the roads but really against the roundabouts. I mean, no one is pro-roundabout once they've visited the Highlands. (laughs) I can picture these trowels dashing off the ferry, excited to go to a mediocre chain restaurant that they've been weirdly craving since it's not available on the islands. So basically just us when we go to the central belt. (laughs) (laughs) The trowels are often described as being a little more down-to-earth than the fairies. They're neither good or bad. They kind of just treat you how you treat them. Well, that's rather lovely, isn't it? It's the kind of mythological character that we want to deal with. Mm. Now, we find Trous mentioned in songs, poems and stories. And their behaviour is always unpredictable. Trous vary from either being surprisingly helpful or a little bit cheeky and mischievous. Depending on what variety of trow you have, they inhabit different places. So we have land and hill trows on the islands and the north coast. And then we've also got sea trows who live in the rumbling, rolling waves of the cold North Sea. Can I be a hotel trow and stay somewhere with central heating or a nice fireplace at least? Well, you can have a nice fireplace, but you need to be one of the hill trowels under the earth. Oh, yeah, I'll take it. I'll take that, yeah. Unless there's badgers who want to play cards with me because, like I've said, not good. (laughs) (laughs) Unfortunately, there is, but we're just going to have to plow through that. (laughs) Now, the hill trowels live in caverns underground, and they seem to appear and vanish at their own whims. Trows are very connected to the ideas of luck and fortune, which we'll see in the coming story. They are apparently about the size of a large bottle. Like a large bottlenose dolphin? No, no, I'm imagining a whiskey bottle. Oh, yeah, that does make more sense. I would love to see a whiskey bottle-sized dolphin. I mean, that would be adorable, but it would probably still take your money at cards, Jenny. <laughs> So what do trows actually look like? So they're small, but are they just like whiskey bottle sized humans? Because in my head, they look like the little rubbery troll dolls with wild colourful hair from the 90s. On a scale of one to seven, how accurate is my current mental image of of them? On a scale of one to fired, Jenny, (laughs) you have been removed from trow identification duty. Ouch. (laughs) Trows have arms and legs and a beautiful head of hair. But their hair isn't an outrageously bright colour, and they wear clothes, probably green ones because that's the colour usually associated with the fairy folk, and I think they're very similar to the ideas of elves and fairies that we have. Okay, so they're basically little humans with hats on. No, Jenny, you're now confusing them with garden gnomes. (laughs) Okay, well, at this point, my mental image is of a tiny dolphin with wild red hair and a hat on, so... I just, I can't help where I am. Not even remotely close, Jenny, sorry. Folklore tells us that these whiskey bottle-sized trows get really active around the Yule period. Long winter nights can perhaps make the imagination Kaylee around a little. So the stories of trows are often used to explain mysterious phenomenon, 
or ill luck during the long cold season. Legend tells us that seven days before Yule, the Trows were offered freedom of the open land. This means that they leave their homes in the heart of the earth and come to play in the above ground where us dolphin-sized humans live. On the same day, the Shetlanders who didn't want to be bothered by any of the more pesky trows would stay in their homes for protection. For if they didn't protect their homes, then trows with malicious intentions could surely find their way in and delight in their trespass. So how do we protect our properties from trows during this time of trow freedom? Well, if you have beautiful cows that need protection, or other livestock, or even just hay bales in need of saving, then you'd better pluck out two straws from the cattle feed at sundown, and then lay them in the form of a cross on the path to the byre where you store your corn, and you better hope that it's not a windy night. Then take one hair from each of your precious cows and pleat them together, and place this bovine braid over the door of the cowshed. Nothing scares off trouble-making trows like a cow barn with pigtails. <laughs> well, what we learn from this is that in times gone by, Shetlanders really focused on cow protection spells before anything else. This makes sense, as cows would have been a major source of both nutrition and income. So losing one or more of your cattle would have been a major blow to any family. But what about those of us unfortunate few who don't have any cows to protect because we forgot our bovine braid and the trowels took them last Yule? Ah, I'm sorry to hear of your loss, Annie. That is a very moving story. But don't worry. (laughs) (laughs) We can still protect your children. Give them oats in milk and make a brose and then say a prayer over them. This will protect them. I don't have children, so can I just have the delicious brose and protect myself instead? Yes, you can. Milk with oats will protect you from trous, but it may not be delicious. It's just a porridge gruel, really. But you should also lock up your valuables and braid your hair, just in case. So people really did lock up their valuables because they suspected that the trows might try to steal anything that wasn't secure. But these little thiefing trows are coming out just after our modern Christmas, aren't they? Because Old Yule is after December 25th. Yes, yeah. Old Yule falls on the 6th of January. It's a very, very old traditional time of celebrations and a great time of festivities and protective milky oats. Because of all the parties and fueled by the oats, musicians were at a premium to play on Old Yule itself and the nights before. I heard a really wonderful oral history of a Shetland fiddler named Tammy Anderson and he was talking about playing fiddle on the 5th of January in 1926 when he had to cycle 13 miles on a very ramshackle bike to play at an old Yule Eve dance. Tammy was only 15 at the time, and so before he set off, his mum gave him a big lecture about how he wasn't allowed to drink any alcohol at the Yule dance And she was also lending him his grandfather's fiddle, but gave him several warnings not to fall off the bike and damage the fiddle. Luckily for Tammy, he and the fiddle made it to the Yule evening dance perfectly fine. He played the fiddle all night until 5am. And in return, they took a collection round to pay him and he received a whole pound. And he felt he was as rich as he possibly could be. Ah, so it's not just the trows who get active at Yule time, it's the people as well. Yes, very much so. In the north of Scotland, the winter weather gives a lot of the more traditional professions some natural breaks from doing any labour outside. 
So the fishermen can't go out because the sea is too choppy. They're not going to catch anything. The farmers have much shorter days for taking care of their livestock, letting them in and out the byre, and they've got only a few hours of sunlight where they're having to graze these animals. People are forced to do work indoors, and this gives them some natural interludes from their more hectic schedules. I think this is part of the reason why folks gave themselves the time and space to have celebrations over Yule because they're taken away from their regular occupations. Well, they can celebrate all they like, but there's no respite from the trows. Well, there is respite from the trows. Trows were active in large numbers over Yule, but then they would all vanish by Uphelia, which is the Shetlandic festival for New Year. Gosh, don't we all want to disappear after the New Year? <laughs> Just... <laughs> I already want to disappear before the New Year. <laughs> but yes, Uphelia is celebrated after the traditional Yule on the last Tuesday of January. And it's still celebrated in modern times. But one of my favourite stories about the trowels in Shetland comes from an oral history told by Tom Tullich of North Yell recorded in 1978. He tells this story about the last of the trowels and it made me just really think about the myths at this time of year. I think it's a really special story. We've reworked it a wee bit but tried to keep the essence. So let's hear about the last of the trowels. Yell is one of the North Isles of Shetland and is a place of raw beauty and rocky coasts. The island's rugged cliffs provide a stunning backdrop for the outstretched rolling green landscape. On a clear day, you can also gaze out to the sea and admire a tapestry of islands, skerries and sea stacks. Yell is home to many seabirds and their cries fill the air as they search for fishing grounds. But even these birds fell silent on old Yule Eve as they listened to the haunting tune that filled every hollow of Yell. Amid the chill and gusty wind of this old Yule Eve, there began to drift a melody of magical wonderment. It roused the spirits of folk and trows alike in distant Cully The tune danced in the landscape, and all knew exactly where it was coming from and where it was heading. It was Rabbi Anderson playing his fiddle sweetly in the night air. Every year the Trows, who were rather enchanted with his playing, invited him to fiddle in there now. But this was a secret gig, and no one else knew of it. People spoke of Rabbi in hushed tones. They all knew that prosperity forever followed him, for he was the luckiest man in all of Shetland. Whatever he tried, whatever he applied his mind to, all his endeavours bore the taste of success. Whether it was fortune or something more mysterious, no one could say. They only knew that something had always blessed Rabbi Anderson. But Rabbi's success was not luck alone, for he had made a special agreement with the Trows. Each year he would enter into the Trow now, their home, and play for them for all of Old Yule Eve. And in return, the Trows gave him his good fortune. It was a dangerous deal, but Rabbi was wise to the ways of the other world. He would abstain from eating any delicious trowel food or consuming any trowel drink. No matter his hunger or thirst, he never succumbed to the call of temptation. But still, Rabbi worried that since no one knew of his agreement with the trows, if one day he should never return, no friends or family would know that he was trapped in the home of the trows. No one would come for him and break his curse but this was part of the deal. Yet despite the risk, this year, like all others, 
He readied himself to play on old Yule Eve. A mist engulfed the rolling coast of Yell as Rabbi, our lone fiddler, approached the entrance to the Trow Hill. Overgrown weeds, mosses and lichens blanketed the rocks protruding from the grassy knoll. It didn't seem like anything special, but Rabbi knew that beneath the seemingly passive facade, a special energy resided within. He took a deep breath and slowly exhaled, calming himself as he stepped up to the entrance. He wrapped his fingers around the bow of his precious fiddle and hesitantly played a note, asking the ancient stones to move. And with a grinding slowness, they parted like an old castle gate. Rabbi stepped through the opening and found himself in a frolicking scene. The gloaming light illuminated the underneath. He felt the same warmth and belonging he had felt since the very first time he took up the instrument. Here was a place where music was its own language and was powerful enough to move even the most jaded of souls. Rabbi smiled as he stepped deeper into the hill and he began to play. He'd had a lot of luck the previous year and his playing was getting better and better. Nothing quite like this had ever been heard before. The beauty of his playing echoed off the waves of the island itself. As he got more and more into the music, he could feel the energy shifting. All of the trows were gathered round, utterly mesmerised by his music. And when he left that evening, with his side of the bargain upheld, He knew that luck would follow him for another year yet, and it was this feeling that kept him returning year after year. But one year, the invitation didn't come. Rabbi felt disappointed, but soon this turned to grief as he realised he would not feel the wonder of playing his fiddle under the earth again, and then his grief poured into heartache. As the winter months dragged by, Rabbi's heart filled with anxiety and longing. He felt a deep unease in the depth of his soul, for he had seen no sign of the trows and feared it would disrupt his future prospects. He depended upon the good luck of playing to the trows in this festive time to bring him good fortune, but he had also grown to like them and was worried. With Yule drawing near, he summoned his courage and he forged his way up to the Trowy Hill, and there waited for whatever fate might have in store for him. When he arrived, something felt immediately off. The moss on the rocks seemed dull and tired. After a while, he managed to find a way into the now, but instead of a frenzy of trows, there alone sat an elderly trow woman, warmed by the comforting blaze of a fire. He asked her what had come of all the trows in the place, and the woman sighed heavily in response to his query. In a soft and sorrowful voice, she told of a minister who had come to Cully who had preached and prayed so fiercely that it burned away the last of the trows' peace. And so... They had all gone away to Pharaoh, searching for the haven of rest they had once found within these walls. Though her years weighed heavy on her heart, she could not bring herself to leave the cherished familiarity of her home for a distant and unfamiliar one. Rabbi did not mind if he was playing to a crowd of a thousand or a room of one, and so he lifted his fiddle and began to play a tune for her with everything he could muster. The old trow tapped her foot softly and hummed along with the music. Her eyes were closed and a smile crept across her wrinkled face. There was no other noise. Only the moving strings of Rabbi's bow floated through the air, 
The melody was beautiful and sorrowful. Each note was being plucked from a heart spilling with emotion. The old trow's face was etched with the bittersweet memory of a lifetime gone by, carried back in time. The notes carried to the waves of the sea not far away, and some waves stopped crashing against the rocks to listen. Other waves decided to carry the tune far and wide, and some trows as far away as the Faroe Islands heard Rabbi's fiddle turning in their souls that night. In Rabbi's music, the old trow could see the faces of her family and friends dancing as they would on the old Yule Eve's past, and for a brief moment, her loneliness drifted away. But this last trow knew that the music could not last forever, so she held on to each and every note surrendering herself to the story the fiddler was spinning from his strings and bow. When at last the final note faded away, the trow sighed, wishing she could hold on to the beautiful music for just a moment longer. The empty room was left thick with sorrow. The fiddler bowed and the old trow wiped away a tear. This was the last tune for the last old trow left in Shetland. A fitting tribute for one so determined to stay on the land she loved. Eventually, the old trow looked up, and out of the opening of her hill, she saw the night sky twinkling. It was as if the stars and moon knew the power of the music and were sharing it with the whole world. And for a brief moment... The entire night mourned the loss of the trows on Shetland. As Rabbi removed his fiddle from his shoulder, the world restarted its cycles and the waves crashed once more. Rabbi never returned to the Trowy No on Old Yule Eve, but he lived a long and happy life. Yet the luck of the trows in North Yale gradually faded away and only their legend remains. Oh, Davy me, there's such a sense of tragedy within this story. And we get stories that are similar to this across Scotland. It shows that there's a broader cultural shift happening in this time period. It's not really that the people no longer believe in the trowels, but the old folks are rather retiring the trowels with them. They're saying that they need to move on now. I find it fascinating because the story isn't saying the trowels aren't real. It's not trying to dispel this and say it's an illusion but rather they're saying that the trows needed to move further north to maintain their trow way of life. For me, on an individual level, it comes across almost like a coming-of-age story. As we get older, all our inner trows move further north, and we lose something from that. And I think a lot of people remember a festive season full of magic, but then at some point they stop believing in magic and their festive periods just aren't the same since. I'll never forget the heartbreak when my older brother told me the clutty dumpling goblin wasn't going to bring me any pudding. Oh, Jenny, (laughs) the clutty dumpling goblin is real and will definitely bring you your pudding. You don't need to worry. It had better. (laughs) (laughs) I'll phone your mum to double check. (laughs) It's a wee bit about the paradox of the season, I think, because with winter, there's so much that feels awe-inspiringly magical, but sometimes the cold bleakness can also bring a sense of disillusionment. I mean, I've definitely felt it with the snow when I'm like, oh, look at all these beautiful snowflakes, they are so stunning, and then all my buses are cancelled and it's less (laughs) festive. (laughs) 
I think with this story, there is a really interesting theme about the way that folklore and religion interact with each other. But we can't take this kind of story in isolation, because though ministers did often preach against superstitions, some ministers were actively involved in preserving the traditional stories of their communities. But you also find that the community is aware that there's sometimes a friction between their religious beliefs and their folklore. So they'll insert a minister character into their fables who is often a hero, though sometimes he is a miserly old meanie. What I find interesting is that when Tom Tullich was telling this story, he actually named and shamed the minister who (laughs) preached the trowels out of Shetland. He said it was Reverend James Ingram, who was a real person, was a real minister, and who lived a really long life from 1776 to 1879. Wow. Which means he hit the ripe old age of 103. So that's a lot of preaching for the trowels to listen to. I was good. That's a lot of luck from the trows, if you ask me. <laughs> and the original storyteller was highlighting that James Ingram was still preaching well into his old age. So he had a great span of time to exterminate the trows from Shetland. However, instead of scaring away the trows, perhaps this minister should have spent his energy on the creatures of the fairy well who were infamous for misbehaving. Ooh, a fairy well. Very well. Let's hear about it. So there were two well-known hills, and on the top of the eastern hill was a well known as the fairy well. And the water that ran from the fairy well was as clear as crystal. And this beautiful water was ice cold, and if you drank it, you would hardly taste a thing, as it would chill you to the bone. Now, this fairy well was incredibly often visited by the fairies during Yuletide. Yuletide woke up the fairies who suddenly wanted to celebrate and be remembered. It was said that during the Heli Nights, so the Holy Nights, the fairies would wave their wands over this well, and from dusk to daylight, they would have in the well three times wine and three times water. Now the fairies who would take the wine were the bad fairies and they would get a little bit too tipsy and they would go into the nearby houses and they would cause chaos. They would wreak havoc for the poor people of Shetland, singing and frolicking. They sound like the little gremlins from the Christmas movie, you know the ones? They were exactly like the gremlins from the Christmas movie. (laughs) get them wet except we've got wine instead of water and these fairies are going to cause devastation now they lived within the tunnels near the well itself and during yule time they would come out under the moonlight drink their wine and then focus their energies on mischief they would whisper rude things to the dairy cows to make their milk go bitter and they would pull up people's potatoes and replace them with rocks instead. And then they'd go home and they'd make delicious fairy potato meals because that's the kind of things they would do. If you were very unfortunate, they would dance and fiddle their way into your kitchen and break your favorite dishes. I have like one fancy ceramic dish and if a drunk trow came tottering to my house and smashed it, I'd be raging. (laughs) I'd be straight on the phone to the minister asking him to banish these little pests to the Arctic ASAP. (laughs) So we get a lot of stories about fairies and trowels drinking a little bit too much in the festive season and ending up in all sorts of sticky situations. One household in Yell even reported finding a wee drunken trow on their windowsill. Now, they tried to catch this trow, but in trying to catch it, the the poor trow woke up and was very startled and managed to sneak away and escape. This trow carried a deep shame in having been seen in such a state. 
so it fled north, so it would never be seen by the Shetlanders again. Aw, now I feel kind of bad. We've all had those nights where, you know, we just don't mention them again afterwards. <laughs> Ping back the trousers. I'll just hide my one good plate around Yule time, which is kind of annoying because that's the only time I'd want to use my one good plate. But, you know, the sacrifices I make for the trousers and fairies to get drunk. I should be given everlasting luck for it, Annie. Or at least some magic fairy well trow wine. Well, Jenny, whereas you may be a drunken trow, I am not. These fairies are not all little drunken rascals. There were also kind-hearted and sweet fairies who lived by the well. Every time there was a birth in Shetland, you could hear these fairies frolicking beneath the ground, partying, dancing and playing music to welcome and celebrate the new inhabitant of the islands. Ah, they do just seem to love a good all-round subterranean celebration. But, just like a good episode of Stories of Scotland, good parties take some planning, Annie. And I have one last story about the Trows doing some prep for one of their fantastical Yule bashes. A fellow by the name of Ollie Fubister, from the island of Papastour, like many men on the island of Papastour, had a wee boat he'd take out fishing. Now, the winter months are a dangerous time to be out on the open sea, and so he'd leave his wee boat high on the shore for these harsh months, awaiting the far away fair weather. But while he wasn't using it, he had noticed that every year, on the eve of Yule, his wee boat would go missing. Luckily for him, when he awoke on Yule morning, his boat was always returned. But still, this mystery puzzled him. And so, one Yule Eve, he decided he'd solve it once and for all, and finally find out who had been borrowing his boat for all these years. And so, when it was still light, he crept down to the shore and hid himself away in the stern of his boat, covering himself with the sail. And luckily for him, he didn't have to huddle down here for too long before his mystery was solved. For just after sunset, he felt the boat start to move and be pulled towards the sea. Ollie couldn't make out who the culprit was until the boat was in the water. But then, peeping from under the sail, he saw three wee trows hopping in. Happy to have his answer and keen to not get caught, he covered himself up in the sail and listened to the steady beat of the oars. The three trows were completely silent. Not a word was spoken between them. They were clearly well practised at this. And eventually, they bumped up against a rocky shore and Ollie peeped out to see the trows hopping out of the boat and entering into a deep, dark cave. In time... Each weed trow came out with an entire cask of whiskey balanced on its shoulder. They loaded them into the boat and began to row back in silence. When the boat finally reached the rough beach it had started at, the trows hopped out and dragged it ashore. They unloaded the first cask of whiskey and then the second. But before they unloaded the third, Ollie got a fright as they all chanted in perfect unison, one for the sleeper, one for the sleeper. Ollie waited until he heard the wee trows hop away over the rocks and he came out from under the sail. He was not so well hidden after all then because there the trows had left him a cask of whiskey, a fine gift just in time for the Yule celebrations the next day. I think this is a gorgeous wee example of the generosity of the trows. Yes, they've been not stealing, but borrowing his boat. But they brought it back and gave him a cask of whiskey for his troubles. So, you know, that's a good deal. Yeah, they're much nicer than fairies. Fairies would probably just steal your shoes and chuck you in the ocean to swim back to shore. Well, these jolly little trowels of Papa Stew were also big dancers. One old woman would step outside her wee cottage every Yule night when the moon was shining brightly. From here, she would watch the trows as they danced and jigged and circled round on the green grass close to the seashore. 
Sometimes she would call her husband to watch the strange performance, but he could never see the Trawi dance until he either held her hand or placed his foot on hers. She definitely preferred it when he held her hand because she didn't like having her toes stamped on with his big fisherman's boot. <laughs> ah, so she had the Trawi sight. This folklore of the trows at Yuletide in Shetland is one that has fascinated me since I first heard of it. I think it's because in Western culture, Christmas is the time of year when we bring up folklore as a collective. The elves of the North Pole could very well be the trows who had to leave Shetland when they no longer felt the island was their home. That's my hot take for the episode, Annie. The elves are the descendants of the Trowy diaspora. <laughs> Well, it's a truly sad thing that there's these stories that there are no more trows on Shetland. And I do hope some have come back down to visit in the past few decades. There's such rich lore about the trows in Shetland, and I'm certain that we're probably going to be revisiting them. Some of my favourite stories about the trows are that fiddlers who would play for them would then learn new tunes from the trows themselves when they were inside the trowy knolls and they'd bring them back for us human folk to hear too so many of the best fiddle tunes on Shetland are said to have come as gifts from the trows and if I think about this that's probably the best Christmas gift to anyone beautiful trow music But I've been thinking of these stories and the only way to bring the trowels and perhaps even the fairies back into these hills is to give them a little shred of belief at this magical time of year. When you're passing a trowy hill or a fairy hill and you wonder, could there be any little creatures scaling inside? Just give them a little a little shred, a little nugget of your belief, and perhaps they will gift you with some kind of creative inspiration. I might be a bit of a souk for these stories, but I still think they've got so much to give us. Thank you all so much for supporting us and listening to our show. May your yule be filled with jolly dancing trows and barrels of mysterious cave whiskey. 2022 has been a fantastic year for us and we're really excited for 2023 and all it brings. Our Spotify wrapped told us that we had created 824 minutes of new content this year. So you should make that 850 after this episode. And that's just, that's amazing that so many of you have been here to listen to all or some of it. Thank you. If you have enjoyed these minutes of solid edutainment that we've been making, then why not consider heading over to our Patreon, where you can help support us as we make these precious minutes, and also hear minutes that no one else has ever heard, apart from all the other Patreons. (laughs) Thank you to our newest Patreon, Jess. Thank you for joining us at this wonderful time of year. I like to think of all of our patrons as trowels, of course, having an amazing time inside the earth, under our magical fairy hill, where we're going to have the most incredible party. We're having a festive feast of trows in blankets and we're finishing it off with some sticky trophy pudding. As trows, we all have our own creative pursuits. We've got some trows knitting beautiful hats that they're going to give out to any cold islanders to protect them from the dreadful frozen north wind. We have some trows who are working on their musical talents and who are going to gift these to the world. We've of course got a whole collective of trow artists who are doing beautiful trow lino cuts and oil colours and all sorts. It's absolutely (laughs) trowific. And of course, we've taken enough whiskey from the enchanted cave that we've been able to befriend the magic badgers who are teaching us how to become absolute excellent poker players apart from the very exceptional professor badger who's 
teaching me how to play chess. I'm not very good at it, but you know, give us a wee shot at it, and before you know it, I'll be I'll be playing the Badger's Gambit. All oh, right. Okay. Okay. Um, Slangeva. Slangeva. 